Round 13 here at Grand Prix Los Angeles. TJ Rogers with Jake Van Lunen, and we are kicking things off with Ari Lax on this black red aggro deck up against Chris Ferber. White, blue, Godfair is a gift. A deck that you and I have not had the opportunity to see too much this weekend, Jake. Yeah, and this deck has been 5 0 Magic Online leagues like it's its job. Uh, a lot of people were pretty excited about this deck after the Pro Tour, uh, putting somebody into the top four. Uh, there was an article about this deck on Channel Fireball this week. So this deck has had some buzz, but we haven't seen it on camera at all. And it is kind of a, you know, a throwback to uh, a standard environment that happened uh, you know, in the last year. Uh, so the goal of this deck is you're playing a lot of cards that allow you to draw cards and then discard cards. You, you're playing a lot of things that mill yourself, things like Minister of Inquiries there. Uh, you want to put something like Godfarer's Gift into your graveyard, then cast Refurbish. That'll return the Godfarer's Gift to the battlefield. And then the Godfarer's Gift begins reanimating uh, powerful threats, uh, namely Angel of Invention and... Uh, once you start attacking with these 6-6 six, six lifelinking Angel of Inventions, uh, most opponents, especially opponents that are uh, red-based, uh, will have an extremely difficult time like ever getting back into the game. So just to break down what's happened so far on the left side of the battlefield, we've got a Scrap Heap Scrounger that has attacked and then been joined by a PNLR on the right side of the field. A Minister of Inquiries kicked things off turn two was a strategic planning. Take a look at the top three. Put one in your hand, the two others in your graveyard. We also saw an activation there from that Minister of Inquiries using an energy. And now heading into turn three, it's going to be a champion of wits. Draw two, then discard two. You're drawing based on its power. And now we've got this 2-1 alongside that Minister of Inquiries facing down PNLR, Scrap Heap Scrounger, and a Thopter. And they are all going to be turning sideways here. Four open mana for Arilax. Yeah, now uh, the Champion of Wits is actually a little more powerful in uh, Blue-White Godfire's Gift than it is in many of the other decks we see it in nowadays. The reason being that when there's an Angel of Invention on the battlefield, it actually increases the power on Champion of Wits, so you draw more cards than you have to discard, even on the front end of that. So you can pay the three mana, and you're still in a position of drawing three, pitching two once that... Man, that is... Angel of Invention really uh, adds a little bit. And it's just that interesting text where it's not draw two, discard two. It's equal to its power, which will eventually work alongside that eternalized function or the God Pharaoh's gift. But for now, it's going to find its way in the graveyard. Scrap Heap Scrounger gets blocked, and it's followed up by a backup Scrounger. Apparently, there was enough junk in the pile to build two of these things. <laughs> PNLR and the Thopter are able to attack on in. Chris Ferber finds himself down to 14 after two swings of three. Minister of Inquiries happens again. From what I can tell, I do not see the God Pharaoh's gift in that graveyard currently. Oh, it is. It's right underneath the Champion of Wits there. Um, Chris Ferber does have the Refurbish. Oh. Uh, the thing that he has to worry about now, and the main card we're looking at is, there it is right there, <laughs> a Braid. And uh, Arilax has uh, two mana untapped. This is really the card that... Uh, you need to worry about most who are playing the Godfarer's Gift deck. And here we see Chris Ferber plays Sunscourge Champion before he attempts to refurbish that Godfarer's Gift, uh, attempting to set up a turn in which Arilax has too much mana tapped to uh, cast an Abrade to deal with that Godfarer's Gift, thus getting some amount of value out of it. If he uh, returns a Champion of Wits, he's going to draw a ton of cards and uh, could set himself up to combo off again the next turn. Uh, Thus, you know, fighting his way through in a braid. Yep, that Sunscourt Champion also great on this battlefield. It's a 2-3, and, and it looks like we're actually enough worried about it that we're going to play a Beaumont Courier, then use P and LR. One mana, sacrifice an artifact target creature, can't block this turn. Putting that falter on the Sunscourge Champion, and then swinging for six. It's going to be P and LR, the Thopter, and the Scrap Heap Scrounger with only this Minister of Inquiries on blocking duty. If it wants to throw itself in the way, there is still some energy floating around. Might be looking to instead use that. Looks like we are going to get that activation. We took the damage. We're down to 10. Land, land, land. Not a whole lot of creatures have made their way to the graveyard just yet. That Champion of Wits is going to be really uh, a big way for Chris Ferber to put that together. But still three open mana on the other side of the field. Chris does need to be cautious about the possibility of a braid. 
Yes, uh, that's that's precisely true. Ari Lax on the previous turn, I really like that play of playing the Beaumont Courier and sacrificing it right away. It made it so that Chris Ferber had no good blocks. It also gave him a way to return that Scrap Heap Scrounger during Chris Ferber's end step. So he allows to he's allowed to leave open mana to threaten a braid, which he may actually have. And uh, if Chris Ferber does not go for the Godfire's Gift, then he would be able to uh, use the uh, the black mana and another red mana to return that Scrap Heap Scrounger to the board and continue applying pressure. So a great way to add power onto the table, take away good blocks from your opponent, and also leave up uh, your most powerful reactive card. Yeah, and one thing is when you do leave up mana to try and represent something, one common thing is that it's important to still be capable of actually doing something if they call you on it. And the situation here is that, you know, if you either have the abrade or if they just pass, you're not wasting that mana. You are going to be able to invest that somewhere else. That's exactly true. The shatter effect of a braid, the half that just uh, deals with an artifact showing up on screen there. So it's like that we get the the alpha corners even. <laughs> 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 All right, there's the champion of wits draw two. I see a search for his Kanta as well as it looked like a fumigate to me. Yeah, I believe you're right. The fumigate, I guess it, that'll put more creatures in the graveyard. Oh, it definitely will. Fumigate is uh, a very powerful card in this matchup. It'll allow Chris Ferber to, uh, you know, restabilize. Uh, the only way he really gets punished for it is by haste creatures and planeswalkers. And I know that that's quite a few things out of this uh, red black deck. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually it pads your life total enough that you're able to uh, set up your your refurbishes in the coming turns. Because post fumigate, your opponent is highly incentivized to use all of their mana. And so that sets you up really nicely for a turn where you can uh, refurbish and not have to worry about a braid. Search for Escanta comes down to the battlefield here for Ferber. Otherwise, it is a Sun Scourge champion, a champion of wit, and the Minister of Inquiries, none of them able to block the Lone Thopter that is going to uh, scout its way over to the other side of the battlefield, take a chip shot in for one, and be joined by the Rekindling Phoenix, who has decreed that it is all clear in the skies. Yes, and a Rekindling Phoenix matches up very nicely against Fumigate, in particular uh, a card that Chris Ferber was really leaning on quite a bit uh, Looks on like this turn in particular. I think we're taking a look at the top card there from the Search for Escanta. There is absolutely the opportunity to transform this into the land this turn. You only need seven cards in the graveyard to do it. We have got an abundance of cards currently available. So that could become Ascanta if Chris Ferber wills it so. Now it is just a matter of do you want to draw this card for turn? I know that you are a fan of if it's not the exact card that I want, it's hitting the bin. Oh, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, search for Ascanta, you got to dream big. You know, you gotta you gotta swing for the fences there. You want, I think right now Chris Ferber, he wants a cast out. I think he wants to deal with this Phoenix in that way. Uh, his uh, his best plan of action, obviously, is to have the Godfire's gift stick around. But it's gonna be hard for him to do that with this two mana open from Ari Lax, basically for forever. Uh, Ari Lax having the option to pump the Thopter with PNLR, not taking that option. Uh, a really big sign that he has the abraid. I mean. Ari knows that Chris Ferber is familiar with playing around of braids, being 10-1-1, one, and one <laughs> deep in a GP. You heard it here. The JVL School of Magic says, if you aren't drawing big, then why are you even searching? It's going to be Angel of Invention joining the battlefield here. This is actually not off of the God Pharaoh's Gift. It is just going to be cast for its actual mana cost. It is a 5 mana, 2-1 on its face, but it has got that Fabricate ability from Kaladesh, which is that when it enters, you can either put the plus one, plus one counters of two on Angel of Invention itself, or you can create two servos. Also has the text of other creatures you control get plus one, plus one, flying, vigilance, lifelink. This is going to be the two plus one, plus one counters against this aggressive red deck. So it's a four, three on the field, and that's going to get to attack next turn with both lifelink and vigilance, able to do double duty, both aggressively and defensively. Yeah, um, so one of the really cool things about the Angel of Invention play here from Chris Ferber is that if Ari Lax does have an abrade, uh, it's really hard for him to not abrade a 4-3 flying lifelink that pumps the rest of Chris Ferber's team. Uh, so right now Ari only has one card left in his hand. He's going to have two after this draw step here. And uh, unless both of those cards are abrade, uh, Ari will really have his work cut out for him here. 
There's the swing in with the Rekindling Phoenix, offering a trade with it, though that Rekindling Phoenix, of course, gets the Elemental, which would allow it to return. Ferber here needs to decide, and yeah, he's just going to throw it right in front. He's willing to take that trade. Interesting, considering that the Rekindling Phoenix will be returning. Maybe just very interested in the four life gain at this stage. Yeah, so Chris Ferber is trying to set up a Fumigate here on this turn, and... Uh, by blocking there and trading, he's going to be able to uh, clean up that egg with this Fumigate here. Uh, now we're seeing him, and he's looking at a fabric, or a, I'm sorry, a refurbish on the top of his library there with the search press can. I believe he already had one in hand, <sighs> but uh, that is a big fumigation. My goodness, throw a tent up. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be over pretty quickly though. That is going to eliminate the board, gain some life for Chris Ferber, and now that elemental is gone. Rekindling Phoenix will not be returning. It looks like we are trying to get some activations here from the PNLR, sacrificing some of those thopters, and I think that is an attempt to limit the amount of life gain that Chris Ferber will be getting. Yeah. So by sacrificing those three creatures, Ari uh, sets himself up so that uh, Chris will only be getting five life off that fumigate. Um, I mean, up to 18 is still pretty good after uh, that yeah. Angel Invention and that Fumigate. Got to be demoralizing as the Black-Red Aggro player to look down after that full board that you had and your opponent is still at 15. Now Chris Ferber, um, I believe his hand remaining is just a pair of refurbishes. So. Well, it might be time to try it. If you got two of them, that helps out a little bit because you can try for it this turn. If there is the Abrade, you get to go for it. It's going to end up in the graveyard again. Looks like there is the Abrade, so it's Minister of uh, Inquiries. And if there is another copy of that Refurbish in hand, then that will be able to grab back that God Pharaoh's Gift. And with the Angel of Invention already in the graveyard, those two plus one plus one counters can go right onto it. It's a base level 4-4 because uh, of God Pharaoh's Gift. And then those additional two, it would mean that just right off the bat, a hasty 6-6 six, six Flying Vigilance is in... <sighs> Well, there's one. <laughs> yeah, so now Chris <laughs> Ferber is just going to be chaining refurbishes for the remainder of this game. Uh, there's going to be a pair of Godfire's gifts on the battlefield in the next turn unless Ari draws in a braid. And uh, We're taking yeah, a the, look. the parade of angels begins. I believe there's only one angel in the yard, but uh, a champion of wits drawing five cards is pretty good at finding a second angel. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that if you do have two copies of Godfire's gift next turn, yeah. what you can do is with the first one, you, you'll notice that it does not target that ability, right? Mm -hmm. You just exile it from your graveyard. And so the first one that you have can go for the Champion of Wits. You will get yeah. to draw four, then discard two. And then the second ability, the other God Pharaoh's Gift, if you have two of them, gets to look at the full graveyard. Does not have to have already decided what it's going to grab. That's exactly true. So there is the Angel Invention. And it looks like we actually went for the Servos. Spreading out that board nice and wide. and. Ari Lax, there's nothing more to be done. Chris Ferber is going to be back up a game heading into game two here in round 13. Is this a matchup that, is that how you expected this match to go? Um, I think that it's very common for the black red aggro deck to uh, be able to tempo out the blue white deck when it draws in a braid. Mm -hmm. um, usually when I'm on a black red deck and I have an abrade in my hand and I'm playing this matchup, uh, I, I find game one to be pretty favorable for me. But uh, Chris Ferber, he played very well. He set up that Fumigate nicely. Uh, he, took a, he took a trade there with that Angel against the Phoenix. Um, everything kind of worked out really well there for Chris Ferber. Uh, post board, things are going to change a bit. There you see Duress on the screen. Uh, Duress is very good at uh, taking Refurbish out of Chris Ferber's hand, so it combines with a braid as another disruption element. Uh, the other thing that Chris Ferber really needs to worry about is that Ari's deck plays uh, Goblin Chain Whirler, which is very good at clearing up uh, the board of random chump blockers that Chris Ferber attempts to uh, defend himself with. Uh, so Chain Whirler, really powerful in this matchup. Uh, it's the main reason why this is no longer a Sacred Cat deck. Uh, which used to be why the Blue White Godfire's Gift deck it did fairly well against red strategies. So uh, quite a few changes here on both sides. Uh, another thing we might see out of Arilax is Magma Spray. Uh, the fact that it exiles a creature can always be important. Uh, that two damage could take down something like a Champion of Wits because 
once that one's back in the graveyard, whether it's the seven man away with the uh, Eternalize or off of a God Pharaoh's Gift, that's really a card that when it's in the graveyard remains a threat. So being able to remove that one and exile it specifically, a really nice way to answer it. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. How about out of uh, Ari Lax's sideboard? Anything that's really going to, you know, increase the uh, the odds against this deck, or is it just... I'm sorry, um, how about Chris Ferber's deck? I misspoke there. Oh, so Chris Ferber's definitely going to want an additional copy of... Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm misreading this. Okay, so I, I believe Chris Ferber has uh, a, a few cards he's definitely bringing in. Settle the Wreckage is a nice one here. There are a lot of sideboard considerations. Uh, there's Lyra Dawnbringer, which I think will be coming in. Uh, there is an additional copy of Fragmatize, which may or may not come in. I actually don't like it in this matchup. I feel like they have uh, enough haste and planeswalkers that uh, when I have played blue-white Godfire's Gift, of course, this was months ago, I wasn't bringing it in against Glorybringer Chandra decks. Um, I think the, the real thing that Chris Ferber wants to be bringing in here, though, is uh, a negate, or three negates. Uh, the fact that they're able to protect his combo, the fact that they're able to, uh, you know, protect things like Lyra Dawnbringer and or uh, Angel of Invention. Those are the types of cards that Red Black Aggro is going to have a really difficult time beating if they're able to stick around. Lyra Dawnbringer having that five toughness there is uh, really powerful because Ari's removal spells really max out at four in cut ribbons. So uh, Lyra Dawnbringer able to live through those and uh, unlicensed disintegration. Uh, is only a two of an Ari's deck, and uh, if if Chris is able to uh, protect something like a Lyra Dawnbringer with a negate from an unlicensed disintegration, it should just run away with the game. Yeah, and that card we saw earlier that the Angel of Invention had to trade with the Rekindling Phoenix just to gain some life, make sure that there was that elemental on the battlefield. Something like a Lyra Dawnbringer, it is just outclassing everything in the air. Glorybringer, uh, I guess that one, yeah, the fu four damage won't hit it, and it's also got first strike. So it just beats anything like a Glorybringer face up. It br beats Rekindling Phoenix straight up. So that's going to be a really big card that just dominates the battlefield. But the tricky part is making sure that it gets there. <laughs> Lance. First strike, it's good. Good defensive ability. Oh, man. It's Actually, I remember that art. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's always interesting to me to that it's like a lance that gives things first strike. Oh, when thank you. I wanted the alpha one. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Got to bring it into the new era. Beta. <laughs> Heading into game two. Ari Lax is going to be on the play. It is going to be this aggressive red-black aggro deck. We've seen time and time again that being on the play, having cards like Beaumont Courier into Scrap Heap Scrounger, any one of these really aggressive curves can be incredibly powerful because of the damage output that can occur before Chris Ferber is even at the four mana required to go for these refurbish situations. Now Chris Ferber just saw a no land hand, uh, wisely chooses to mulligan. <laughs> On the draw? Yeah, I mean, he it, <laughs> it's true that he could have drawn five lands in a row, in which case that hand looked like it was quite powerful. I also, I, I spied a, uh, a Lyra Dawnbringer, so those are going to be uh, entering the fray for games two and three. You ever notice how your no land hands always look really powerful if you had lands? Yeah, I mean, that's because you have so many cards. <laughs> you have so many spells <laughs> in the hand. <laughs> Seven good cards. If I only had three lands as well, Woo. it'd be good living. All right, so we're going to be taking a look at the opening six here for Chris Ferber looking for some land aid. Oh, four. Ari Lax on the play, up a card and looking to dig back into this one. Currently at a record of 11 and one. So still looking pretty good overall for the tournament. Obviously every matchup is critical. Every time that you can get a win, it means that you are one step closer, one step safer and getting into that top eight. But 11 and one is a very nice record to have at this stage. Yeah, both these players uh, fighting right now for an opportunity to uh, playing the top eight this weekend. We see that Beaumont Courier come on down. It is the nice, aggressive turn one play followed up by Minister of Inquiries. Actually, a really nice card to get right in the way 
of Beaumont Courier does shut out a decent portion of its game plan. Scratch that. It's going to be a braid eliminating that one. Only one card in the graveyard, and it is going to be another attack in for one. So Chris Ferber down to 18, but also keep an eye on that stack of cards that's going to be piling up underneath the Beaumont Courier. At a certain point, if it looks like you're playing Jenga, Chris Ferber is going to have to be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Beaumont Courier, uh, we have sound like a broken record. We've talked about it all weekend, but this is one of the very best cards against most blue decks in this format. The blue-white Godfire's Gift deck is quite a bit different because it does play a lot of creatures, so Beaumont Courier, not quite the powerhouse that it is against uh, the Esper Control decks or the uh, fog base decks. However, still uh, an incredible card, exactly what you want to be doing on turn one with three cards underneath that. Uh, Chris Ferber may be forced to use the, yes, forced to use a Thopter Arrest to deal with a one mana card that's already dealt him three damage. So that's going to be exiled until it leaves the battlefield. There is still this Kari Zev, and one thing that we're seeing here is Arilax trying to put down as much pressure as possible because once four mana is available for Chris Ferber, the, you know, right now it's not a big concern, but once this graveyard fills up and once it's four mana available and a God Pharaoh's Gift in the graveyard, it's going to become very difficult for Arilax not to leave up two open mana. So trying to put as much pressure, taking a look at this hand as well with this Doomfall, we're going to get to exile one of these cards. I see Angel of Invention, Sunscourge Champion, chart a course that's draw two, then discard a card unless you've attacked, and a cast out four mana. It's got flash, and it's an enchantment to exile a non-land permanent. Yeah, cast down, uh, particularly important for dealing with Rekindling Phoenix in this matchup. Also uh, a nice answer to Planeswalkers when Ari has uh, blockers to defend against uh, the early creatures that have been played out, or Chris Ferber just doesn't have uh, any pressure on the board. Looks like we're actually going to take the Angel of Invention. That's going to be exiled. The interesting thing here is that Chris Ferber only has those three lands. So the Charter Course might become increasingly relevant. Also, that Sunscourt Champion, it is only a three-mana play. And Chris Ferber is going to go up a little bit of life. Arilax must have some sort of answer in mind. The 2-1 that's attacking into the Sunscourt Champion, it's an easy block. There's still going to be this 1-3. It's got Menace and First Strike. Chain Roller comes down. That's the answer that Arilax had. Two damage from the Ragavan, and then one damage from the Chain Roller, dealing one damage to each creature that Chris Ferber controls, as well as Chris Ferber himself. And now that is going to be attacks for six coming in, and we are still... Very difficult here. It's going to be internalizing the Sunscourge Champion. Four mana plus you have to discard a card as an additional uh, cost of that eternalized mechanic. But now it is a 4-4. Four, four. Chris Ferber gains four life. It's going to be a duress to kick things off. We still see the same two cards that we saw previously. And that chart, of course, might be the option. This is going to be a card that will fill up the graveyard. It'll dig to additional lands like that fifth, you know, trying to find either the fifth land to cast Lyra Dawnbringer or Angel of Invention. Also will just put God Pharaoh's Gifts in the graveyard. Yeah, uh, another thing about chart, of course, is that it could actually draw two cards here for Chris Ferber. He could block with that Sunscourge Champion and uh, still get aggressive. Pull pretty it. head, yeah. Yeah. Land, then Lyra as the draws. That'd be pretty good. But of course, now we'll never know. It's going to be in a braid to finish it out twice now. That charming monkey has joined Kari Zev into combat, thrown itself into the fray, and come away with the combination to take down a threat. Yeah, Ragavan. MVP. Doing good work here. Absolutely. Two cards in hand for Chris Ferber, and absolutely on the back foot right now. Chain Whirler and Kari Zev. Getting it done. We see the cast out take away Kari Zev, but Chain Roller is going to keep on doing its thing. It's going to be back to Chris Ferber's turn. No uh, really presence on board other than the elimination of Ari Lax's. And it's going to be a champion of wits making its way to the battlefield. Draw two, discard two. Finally, an opportunity to dig into this deck and try and put something like a God Pharaoh's Gift or one of these uh, creatures that will eventually be reanimated by it into the graveyard. Looks like it's going to be a land and one other card that I didn't quite catch because of the angle that we've got right now. Yeah, so Chris Ferber had a land in hand, uh, chooses to hold on to a non-land card here with the four mana that he has in play. Uh, I think the cards he was looking for most are Angel of Invention and Lyra Dawnbringer, uh, now hoping to draw a fifth land to 
cast one of those if he was lucky enough to find one. There we've got the swing in for three. We're down to eight. It's Heart of Kieran and three mana available. So holding that up could be something like an unlicensed disintegration represented at the moment. Even has the artifact to combine with it. Could be any other number of interactive spells or maybe it's nothing. That's what uh, that's what Ferber's hoping for. Yeah, and uh, Ari used an abrade very aggressively early on in the game, then used another abrade uh, to finish off the 4-4 four -four, uh, Sun Scourge champion. Yep. So uh, Chris Ferber thinking that uh, a pair of abrades have already been used may not be uh, too worried here. Yeah, and that is an interesting decision for Ari, really valuing the early game tempo of making sure that this initial aggression cannot be stopped or slowed down in favor of saving up a card that is considered sort of the you know ace up the sleeve so to That's speak uh, to answer it but it's gonna Remember. be glory bringer coming on in it's gonna be crewing up the heart of kieran and just a swing in the air for eight nothing to be said about it those abrades weren't necessary they enabled it to be eight damage remaining eight damage comes in through the skies those champions of wits are looking a lot less witty. Yeah, now, uh, you know, Heart of Kieran applies so much damage so quickly. The fact that it flies makes it really hard for uh, Chris Ferber to deal with it without him getting to his five drops. Um, and we just saw there uh, how quickly it ends the game. Five chops of these four power flyers just ends the game. And uh, these haste creatures mean that uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to be uh, on a... On a post-board fumigate plan against Black Ride when you're on the draw. Yeah, and we just saw Black Ride really dominating that game. The first game, much more of a struggle, but still was absolutely kind of this back and forth thing, eventually finished by a couple of refurbishes, but Arilax has got to feel pretty good heading into game three in both of these games. He's had a, a, a nice way into it. You know, he's held his own, and in one of them, he took away the win. Yeah, so uh, Ari here is going to be on the draw. Uh, in the last game, he... Uh, he got to have a really aggressive start. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that he was able to uh, play Beaumont Courier into a removal spell and then uh, play 3-4-5, I believe, off of that, or at least 3-4 uh, in terms of casting cost cards in the coming turns, it put Chris Ferber in a position where he really needed powerful answers. And uh, Chris Ferber wants to be playing a more proactive plan. He wants to just be kind of gumming up the board until he gets to the point where God Pharaoh's gifts just take over the game because they're more powerful than everything else. Uh, he was never able to get there, and he was stuck on three lands uh, for a couple turns, and that gave Ari the opportunity to rip all of the important cards out of his hand with things like Doomfall, and uh, it was just an easy win there for Ari. And we even saw that really early abraid in the game, taking down a Minister of Inquiries, but the situation on the, you know, it was never even a fear of Ari Lax to try and find another Abraid to be prepared for that Godfarer's Gift because that was the only card that was ever filling up the graveyard until really the last couple stages of the game in which those Champion of Wits were coming down. So that Abraid using it on the creature that might get the Godfarer's Gift in the graveyard as opposed to the Godfarer's Gift itself really paid off because that Beaumont Courier was able to continue swinging in. Uh, exactly, and, and I think that's one of the more important parts of this black-red deck is that the removal that it plays, you don't really want to just be killing creatures when, you, when you're when you not attacking yourself. You want to create a presence so that when you're playing these removal spells, each one of them is not only taking away from what your opponent's trying to do, but it's also allowing you to crack in for damage. So you're pulling further and further ahead while you're pushing your opponent further and further behind. And that's the thing that makes this deck so powerful in the current standard environment. Yeah, a lot of extremely powerful cards. Black Red, it has been the talk of the town. It has made itself known throughout this standard environment. And it always seems to, you know, the little tiny changes in the deck. You know, this week we're seeing a lot of PNLR. Last week we saw Uncrop Crashers. It's just that little bit of versatility, but so much strength at every converted mana cost in the deck that it's able to put together a really nice game plan. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Uh, the power, the mean power level of cards that are, are in this black-red aggro deck is just so high. Uh, this is just a uh, a pile of very, very strong magic cards. And uh, I think if, if you're looking to get involved in standard, if you want to go to your local shop and beat people, and you're not sure what the best deck in standard is, black-red aggro is where you should go. This is the deck that, you know, basically the pros decided this was the best deck at the Pro Tour. Mm -hmm. um, you had people testing for 
weeks in some cases. People who you know really focus on magic as the most important thing in their lives, they they put weeks into a single magic tournament and you know locked themselves in a hole, tried to find the best standard deck they could possibly find, and the vast majority of them came out of that hole holding a black red aggro deck. I've always kind of wondered this. I'd love to see some sort of meter that measures the amount of hours that are put into a deck list. When you have that many just high-level minds of the game of Magic, taking a look at this singular deck and what kind of hours can go into the testing to really just hammer out these really small details. You know, one difference in a card slot could make a fairly big difference over the course of a 15-round tournament. So we're going to be jumping into game three here. Like you said, Chris Ferber is going to be on the play. Now that's going to be a really big start. Something like that Minister of Inquiries, we've seen it on turn one in both games one and two. But having a one-two on the battlefield immediately, that already is getting in the way of any kind of Beaumont Couriers. The commanding turn one play, it shuts it down entirely. This research violates consulate law. <laughs> my impression of Minister of Inquiries. That's a pretty um, good one. Thank I you. Uh, yeah, so in the last game, we saw Ari uh, have access to multiple <laughs> Chain Whirlers. Uh, chain Whirler is a card that I think is really important in this matchup. We talked about it after game one, where Ari uh, didn't draw the Chain Whirlers until it was too late. Uh, the problem with playing against Chain Whirler when you're this white-blue Godfire's gift deck is that your blocking plans become very bad. Uh, when you're trying to line up two threes against, uh, you know, two twos, when you're blocking Ragavans, it, you end up having your creatures finished off, and your opponent doesn't really have to do anything. They, like, it's no, no cost to them. They're still advancing their board, getting an, another 3-3 three, three first striker out into the battlefield, dealing the opponent some damage, and in doing so, they're also cleaning up creatures that were trying to play defense against a more aggressive opponent. You know, I'm pretty curious right now. This Minister of Inquiries, it's a 1-2. It takes a lot of strength to rip a book in half. Like, shouldn't this card be a 2-1? That is, that is a pretty impressive feat of strength. Well, maybe if they already, like, snip it at the top so it's easier to rip. Oh, yeah, that's even, that's actually easier. Yeah. <laughs> he was ripping it right in half like a phone book. All right, it's going to be turn one, and there it is, the Minister of Inquiries. One, two, three games back to back. That's exactly what you want to be doing turn one. But it's so quickly answered by a Magma Spray. No pressure on the battlefield, but that goes for both sides. It's going to be Search for Azkanta. Really powerful turn two play here. Yeah, now Chris Ferber, he's going to have uh, a lot more control over his draw steps. This is going to ensure that he hits land drops if he's having trouble doing that. It's also going to fill his creature up with, or fill his graveyard up with creatures for a God's Fire gift plan, or it could simply f get him closer to cards like Lyra Dawnbringer. Eventually, it's going to flip, at which, in which case it'll start ramping him. It's Karizev coming down to the battlefield, and we are going to throw a God Pharaoh's gift into the graveyard with that search for his Kanta. Imagine, you know, looking at this opening hand for Ferber, a Minister of Inquiries and a search for his Kanta. That's the recipe to getting four mana on turn three. Two activations from that Minister of Inquiries plus Search for Azkanta can really lead to some of the most explosive starts from this deck. That's definitely true. Uh, two activations from a Minister of Inquiries, uh, six cards, the one card flipped on the graveyard from the Search is seventh card, and uh, that's, I, th I think, the fastest available flip to Azkanta the Sunken Ruin in Standard right now, if anybody's playing. It's gonna be Champion of Wits coming down, draw two and throw two islands back into the graveyard, a watery grave, if you will, and it's going to be an attack on in with Karizev and this Ragavan for three. Now, the Karizev, it is a 1-3. You'd think it'd be nice and easy to interact with, but it's actually got two mechanics that really make it a bit tricky. It's got Menace, and it's got First Strike, a card that's really well, uh, well suited to just dealing with, you know, two chump blocks, even throwing in front of it. You've got to be careful what creatures you're actually going to put in front of it with the two. So it is going to be a Doomfall taking a look at strategic planning, Minister of Inquiries, and a land, and now it is going to be just the Minister in hand for Chris Ferber alongside that Champion of Wits. We do have that search for Azkanta. 
Not an enormous amount of cards in hand just yet, though. That Doomfall actually exiles it, so it's not even doing part of the work for Chris. Angel of Invention goes to the graveyard here. We have one more land in hand, but we would need the fifth land to really capitalize on that. There's the Refurbish! Wow! And, the, oh, and we are all tapped out on Ari Lax's side of the battlefield. Angel of Invention comes back as a 4-4. We have got the ability. It's that Fabricate mechanic. Are we going to make servos, or is it just going to be a 6-6? Six, six? That's a difficult number to remove when you've got cards like Cut to Ribbons in this one. Similar to what you were talking about, Lyra. That's going to be a, an interesting decision point going for those servos to help widen the game plan or really just go as much damage, as much lifelink as possible in the skies. Yeah, so I think that the big question here of uh, counters versus servos uh, comes down to how worried you are about unlicensed disintegration versus how worried you are about something like uh, cut ribbons. And it looks like Chris Ferber has decided that he is more worried about the unlicensed disintegration. He's going to make sure that he leaves this with something because his only other card in the graveyard, I think, uh, creature is that, actually, no, that Minister of Inquiries got hit by a magma spray. I think this is his only shot right now as it sits. And he, he will be able to uh, perhaps put another creature in the graveyard with Search for Ascanta, depending on how kind the top of his library is to him. But Ari here... Um, you know, he's in a really rough spot because even if he did have the Abrade, that would take up the majority of his turn. Uh, so now he's in a situation where, oh, ho, ho, ho. well, that's a nice one. That's a very nice one. That's Angel of Sanctions. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent your opponent controls. It's got Embalm, too. You don't even need the Godfrey's Gift to bring it back. But it is going to be the Abrade pre-combat. The only issue here is that the Angel of Invention is still on the battlefield. It's still swinging. And, I mean, the word aggro is next to Ari Lax's deck. It can't be good when your opponent's gaining four life every swing. Yeah, and I mean, now, Chris Ferber has turned the tides. He's become the aggressor. Uh, that's not where black-red aggro wants to be playing from. Black-red aggro wants to have a board advantage and then to be killing what the opponent is casting uh, while applying pressure. Once you're on a defensive game plan with the black-red deck, it can be really difficult to get back into the game, especially against something like an angel of invention yep and keep your eyes open on that angel of sanctions by the way beyond the god pharaoh's gift which could have brought it back as a 4-4 it actually mm -hmm. does have the ability of embalm for six mana mm -hmm. to come back to the battlefield as a token of it currently chris ferber has got five so even a land off the top would actually enable creating more of a board presence against this and right now that uh angel of invention pumping everything yeah, everything gets plus one, plus one, which means that even your Minister of Inquiries is a mighty 2-3. Now it looks like something that can rip that book in half. Yes. <laughs> it's, like, it's bigger than a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be another Angel of Sanctions into the graveyard off of this Minister of Inquiries. Now the only question is we're looking for a refurbish. This is the uh, Search for Asconta that we just saw, taking a look, and we have decided that we like whatever card was on top. Now we just get to see what it was. Maybe a removal spell could be something like a cast out. No, it's Lyra Dawnbringer, and we are just going to pick it up. Ari Lax, no hope left in this one. That is going to be Lyra Dawnbringer <laughs> and Angel of Invention cleaning up the battlefield. These life-linking angels, both of them giving each other plus one, plus one. Lyra Dawnbringer giving other angels that plus one, plus one. Angel of Invention, the full board. Yeah. Angel Tribal. Angel. Apparently well, quite good against Black Red when you're able to assemble it. You only need two to make <laughs> it happen, apparently. So that is going to round out this match. But, of course, we are going to have more magic coming at you right after these messages.
Welcome back, and it is still round 13 here at Grand Prix Los Angeles. TJ Rogers here with Jake Van Lunen, but of course we couldn't just leave it be with one match this round. There's more magic to be seen, there's more magic to be played, and we have got another great one coming up with really another deck that has been a huge feature of the most recent two weeks of magic. It's been that Turbo Fog deck constantly, so let's go ahead and check it out. We'll see you down there. And there you have it on the right side. It is Blake Hurdle on Turbo Fog up against Corey Baumeister on Esper Control. Now we're going to go ahead and watch this at a little bit of an accelerated rate, a bit of that speed magic for us. It's going to be a two mana play from Turbo Fog, and that is going to be Search for Azkanta. Coming down to the battlefield. Back over to Corey Baumeister. Esper Control, how do you feel about this deck's ability to contend with Turbo Fog? Um, I think the turn to search for Azkanta is going to be a huge problem for Corey in this game. Uh, normally, Corey can uh, play the game in, a, in such a way where there are only a few cards that he really needs to worry about, only a couple cards that he really needs to counter. Uh, however, if your search for Azkanta happens to be one of those cards, and if your opponent has it early enough and can get it underneath your counter magic, underneath your disallows, then you find yourself in a really bad position. So even though the majority of Blake Hurdle's deck uh, doesn't really do anything against Corey's, uh, once Azkanta gets flipped into the Sunken Ruin, then uh, Corey's going to have a really, really hard time overcoming that. And we do see a couple of fortunate draws there. Your deck, of course, does have both Haze of Pollen and Root Snare. Both times that uh, we've seen Blake Hurdle draw one of those, it has been Haze of Pollen. That way he is able to cycle it, though I do think he ended up with one copy of Root Snare in his hand, and that is just not going to be a relevant card in this game. No, it's definitely not. The, the important thing for Blake here is that he's playing a deck where he can pick fights on Corey's end step, and he has big card advantage engines that uh, that he can punish Corey with if Corey chooses to fight those counter wars on his own end step. So Blake Hurdle can go for a Nexus of Fate at the end of Corey's turn. Corey will basically be forced to counter it. Otherwise, Blake is going to get two turns in a row. And if if he does counter that, it's going to give Blake an opportunity to uh, resolve to ferry or. Uh, just start rifling through his deck with the S count of the Sunken Ruin. Uh, Corey here, though, with Teferi advantage. And we're going to go ahead and immediately just downtick that one. It eliminates this search for Azkanta. Corey Baumeister really respecting the power level of that search. Yeah, and uh, he, he recognizes that as uh, one of the more important cards in this matchup. Blake also recognizes that as one of the more important cards of the matchup. And immediately going to redraw it here. It did get uh, put a couple of cards down, but then a Glimmer of Genius immediately resets it back into the hand. We could be deploying it this turn alongside. Uh, looks like we might actually be going for that Karn instead. So now it is a Karn against a Teferi. This is going to immediately go up a counter. It's going to be two of these cards as options. Which one do you want in the hand? It's Supreme Will and it's Charter Course. Neither one great cards for Corey. Yeah, now, uh, Corey, happy to put that Charter Course in Blake's hand over the Supreme Will, specifically because, you know, Supreme Will, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a counter spell, and yep. Corey wants to fight those battles. So he wants to win those battles. Search for Azkanta also comes down to the battlefield, and Blake has got to be feeling pretty solid, especially considering that this was his backup play, or his follow-up play, to his opponent playing out Teferi, which is just a dominating card in this standard. But then Avraska's Contempt is going to eliminate this card. Now, they're going to keep this Supreme Will in the Exile Zone. This has got a Silver Counter on it, and this is relevant because any future cards that Blake Hurdle finds will be able to use that Minus ability and put that card into uh, Blake's hand. It does not care if it was that particular card. That's absolutely true. We're going to go ahead and fire down this chart, of course, and it is going to be drawing two cards, discarding two cards. Looks like we do have another copy of that search for Azkanta. Might be deciding to put that one away. There's also a root snare here, which is not going to be doing a whole lot of work, and that's going to be the option taken. Still quite a few cards in hand, though, and it might just be... Looks like a lot of them are land, actually. Land might be an issue for this so, so far. It's two Haze of Pollens, a search for Azkanta, and two lands. Not a lot of power level, not a lot of game plan. Glimmer of Genius here for Corey Baumeister. He's got this Teferi to back it up. He's going to put one card on the bottom, draw two. Untapping with that six mana available. 
He's got a full grip of cards, too. He's ready for a fight. Yeah, Corey, uh, just wanting to ensure that he has uh, enough blue mana to cast multiple disallows. Going to continue taking up this Teferi. And Blake Hurdle, his deck is designed to beat creature decks. He's got all these fogs. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be his issue here. Uh, once Corey has Teferi advantage, things can get hard for Blake. Though, I mean, Blake is also much better at, you know, picking fights on end steps. Blake is much better at uh, ensuring land drops over the long term of the game. And Blake had uh, an early search for Azkanta advantage, which will make him flip right now. So a lot of powerful things happening for both players. Yeah, and Corey Baumeister, just a prolific standard player. Mm -hmm. In, I think, the most recent year, was able to put up just a medley of results. Yeah, I think... Uh, Corey is absolutely one of the best standard players alive. Uh, brother of Brad Nelson. The two of them have done incredible things in standard tournaments over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, seeing the two of them in the same uh, top eight last year was just uh, one of the highlights of Magic coverage for me. Absolutely. So we have got now a search for Ascanta, as well as Ascanta the Sunken Rune, the reason why we are able to do that. It is a legendary card, but it only cares about the name that it sees. So this is going to be going to the graveyard. A disallow stops that, but even resolving, they would have both existed on the battlefield happily, because while they are both legendary and they are both the same card, because one of them is transformed, they're only looking at the land. But a Field of Rune then able to take down the Azkanta, the Sunken Ruin, and both of these options suddenly getting eliminated for Blake Hurdle. He's able to take a look at the top four. He's going to grab one of these to go to his hand. It's going to be Charter Course, and they're both going to search up a basic land. It certainly does make putting the cards on the bottom of the library a little bit less uh, meaningful. Yes. <laughs> now, Corey... Uh Corey here, I really like the fact that he chose to counter the second copy of Search for Ascanta. Wanted to make sure that Field of Ruin was going to take away uh, that engine that Blake had. Now Corey's the only one with the card advantage engine. He's got a hand that's just stocked with card draw and counter he's magic. Got three disallows and a negate and a glimmer of genius. Like that, this hand can handle anything. Yeah, and I mean, he he even has a pair of torrential gear hulks. <sighs> Corey's hand is ready for just about anything that Blake can muster. It's going to be a really uphill battle, and I just, Blake doesn't even realize it yet. You know, you're, you're looking down this enormous amount of untapped mana. You're sitting against a Teferi, but if he had knowledge of what was in that hand, I have to imagine that he'd be uh, feeling pretty disheartened. It's going to be that chart, of course. He gets to draw two cards, put one of them in the graveyard. And at what point, uh, let me ask you, he has those Torrential Gear Hulks in hand. Okay, it looks like it's going to be now. I was going to ask at what <laughs> point he's going to prioritize doing that over any of the ones that are in hand naturally to make sure that he can actually start attacking. Looks like uh, around now is when he'll prioritize that. Yeah, and I mean, he knows that the Turbo Fog deck has a ton of dead cards against him, uh, a ton of cards that he's not particularly wor worried about. Now he actually has mana to uh, which he can combine to both cast the Torrential Gear Hulk and have disallow up if he so desires. Uh, last turn he had uh, negate backup, I believe, for the uh, oh torrential my. gear hulk. So uh, I think he's got two more gear hulks in hand too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Corey is uh, <laughs> just in solid position here. And the the thing early on in the game, we thought there was going to be an issue because Blake was able to resolve that super early search for Ascanta. He was able to get it in underneath counter magic, mm -hmm. but uh, Corey was able to aggressively use the Teferi to get it off the battlefield before it was able to flip, then was able to counter a second copy when it came down, find a Field of Ruin, get it off the table, and since this Teferi has been on the battlefield, Corey has just been at a massive advantage in this game. So we're going to cycle that Haze of Pollen away from the hand, still one copy of Root Snare and two lands, and that's been a big issue for Blake. He just keeps finding copies of these lands that have been gumming up his hand and have been really preventing him from actually making meaningful plays. Does have that Field of Rune out, but there's not a whole lot of targets. Corey Baumeister, not a single play yet in the form of anything like a, an Ascanta that you'd want to look out for. Now it's going to be the backup Torrential Gear Hulk, I think. Let's try and take this one down as well. And now it is unlikely that this... Oh, it's actually going to be just the Disallow. All right. 
So he's going to let it continue being, and there's part of the reason he wants to maintain this Glimmer of Genius and still holding up three mana for any other disallows, any other negates. Still has this Torrential Gear Hulk, plusing up this Teferi, swinging in for five, and is going to be Blake down to five. Search for his contact. Finally joining the party, though at this point, it's probably going to claim all the credit, but I don't really think it did much. I don't think so. Either. Yeah. I'm going to give this one to... <laughs> I'm going to say this was a Teferi deck doing Teferi things. There's the Nexus of Fate. It's the last hope of Blake Hurdle, and it is going to be really just shut down by the watery jets of Torrential Gear Hulk. That's going to get shuffled back into the library, and looking at this hand, now Blake's hopes rest on a Root Snare. Negate takes it down, and that's going to be the pickup. Blake Hurdle is going to be falling in this first game. Now we are jumping ahead to game three. Blake Hurdle taking game two, and now we are going to see the final showdown between Hurdle and Baumeister. Yeah, Corey in uh, games two and three needs to start worrying about Carnage Tyrant. Uh, this is a card that works exceptionally well against Esper Control. Esper Control does not want to be sideboarding in or keeping in uh, board sweeping effects against decks like Turbo Fog, and as a result, you can really punish them quite hard uh, with a card like uh, Carnage Tyrant. There, though, I don't Ooh. know if you see it, but I see it. Tell I, me more. All right, so it detection looks like tower? Corey has a detection tower here. <sighs> what a very cool card. Now, this detection tower, it is a land that has been sneaking into some of the sideboards, some of actually the main deck occasionally for these and it is a way to answer that carnage tyrant it is a way to answer vine mare a couple of cards that have really started getting more popularized but it is a land that taps for a colorless mana you can pay one mana and tap it and until end of turn your opponents and creatures your opponents control with hexproof can be the target of spells and abilities as though they didn't have hexproof so that just two mana because you do have to invest tapping the land itself disallow here taking down that to fairy but then it's, it's two mana addition to any removal spell, and you're able to actually take it down. Another answer, and I'm not certain if I see any copies. Maybe you've uh, got a better eyes on Bowmaster's list. But Doomfall, another really nice option against those Carnage Tyrants that have been really rising up in popularity against Esper Control. Yeah, Corey, uh, with no Doomfalls here, playing a much more Drago-centric version of the deck. Lots of instants here. All right, so really that Detection Tower is his only chance against it, which he already has it, so not too big of a deal. Ha there is a Field of Rune in the graveyard for Baumeister. We do know that Blake Hurdle does have copies of Field of Rune, though, so keep an eye out for that one. It was a card that did not do much for Blake last game, but I think he'd be very happy to see it this time. So this Nexus of Fate, I believe, is happening on Corey's end step, and uh, that's very important because Corey here, he has, uh, I believe he has the option of either disallow or Torrential Gear Hulk. Either one will prevent him from casting the other on the following turn. But this fight that Blake is picking is a fight that he's forcing Corey into. Uh, Corey can't afford to let that resolve. Mm -hmm. And now Blake's going to get to untap and presumably will get to be able to resolve something uh, pretty impressive. And there's the Field of Rune, so that's going to be able to take down that Detection Tower if it becomes relevant. And there's a Carnage Tyrant passing it back, though. That Detection Tower is still on the battlefield, though. This is potentially dangerous. Looks like it is going to be Vizier of Many Faces, another card that can actually answer these hexproof creatures. When it enters the battlefield, much like many of the clone effects of the past, it does not target. It just enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. And it looks like uh, you could go for the Torrential Gearhulk. We've also seen in some cases copying their opponent's torrential or, uh, Carnage Tyrants. Yeah, and it looks like that's what Corey chose to do here. So Corey's Vizier of Many Faces right now. A Carnage Tyrant. <laughs> so much Carnage on the battlefield. Now we're going to be uh, seeing a battle for the crown between these two. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and plus up that Teferi. Had the option of going for a minus to try and eliminate one of these two cards on the battlefield. Has decided that that was not the priority. And instead drawing cards, getting this additional mana is where it's at. Looks like we are going to fire off this Field of Rune, pointing it at that Detection Tower. Yeah, now uh, th that Field of Ruin being able to target that Detection Tower, uh, pretty huge here. Looks like we didn't see it, though. We saw Blake Hurdle really considering it, and I think he's running through a couple of options here. Possibly still in the end step. Nope, it's going to be a pass back, so that Detection Tower still very much alive. And part of it might be because Blake Hurdle has actually got 
I think, multiple copies of Negate in hand. And he might just be more interested in seeing Cory Baumeister invest the mana into the Detection Tower and cast that removal spell only to have it negated. And that means that he's not doing anything else. And then Blake gets to untap with the ability to actually make some progressive plays. Looks like we are going to be left with a Carnage Tyrant and a Carnage Tyrant on the battlefield. That Torrential Gear Hulk gets blocked into 5-6 by the 7-6 Carnage Tyrant. Field of Rune, it is going to be targeting at this Detection Tower, and we are both going to go ahead and find a basic, so neither one of these <laughs> Carnage Tyrants is going to be targeted anytime soon. And there it is, Vraska's Contempt, Negate, Disallow, Negate, and that is going to be Blake Hurdle coming away with a big win. Corey Baumeister tapped out and unable to remove the Carnage Tyrant. This 7-6 now on the battlefield. Corey is going to fall down to 13, and any other powerful plays that Blake Hurdle has got are going to come down like Search for Oskanta. Yeah, and Corey cannot be happy with this situation now. The uh, Carnage Tyrant on the other side of the battlefield is uh, you know, presenting a two-turn clock. He might just have to trade his own. And... Blake's about to flip this Ascanta into Ascanta the Sunken Ruin. I think I just saw a Nexus of Fate on top of that library if I was looking right. Also, is that a Jace's Defeat in Blake's hand? That looks like a Jace's Defeat. There it is. Counter that one. And we are going to transform it. And life is good for Blake. It's going to be Nexus of Fate. Only two mana available when we have got two swings with this Carnage Tyrant available, though that Vizier of Many Faces that you see at the top of the battlefield for Cory Baumeister is also a Carnage Tyrant. So attacking in with it does mean that they would likely end up trading. Oh, and we get another copy of Nexus of Fate. We're looking at another turn, and notably this time, look at that mana. We've got enough for Oskanta the Sunken Rune, and we just found a Karn's Temporal Sundering, as well as another copy of Nexus of Fate. So we are going to be heading into the third turn. Now we've got a Negate, and it's going to be another copy of this Nexus of Fate. Let's run it back, take a look at the top four. Are you ready for... To try. Oh, looks like we're not going to find it this time, though remember, Blake Hurdle is going to have the draw step and be able to dig first if really needed. We also do now have a Planeswalker, so it's going to be an activation here. Still not finding it. Blake is only going to have to hold himself to four additional turns. Still a very impressive turn there from Blake Hurdle. Or turns, you know, either way. It's going to be Karn plussing on up. Is it Search for Oskanta or is it Baral, Chief of Compliance? We're going to go ahead and play our land for the turn. And now it is a Karn and a Carnage Tyrant facing down the opposing Tyrant. Vraska's Contempt is going to eliminate this one in a gate from Blake Hurdle. And it is going to be another copy of Vraska's <laughs> Contempt <laughs> for Corey Baumeister. Karn's off the battlefield. And we found another Nexus of Fate. Right back at it. Right back to the old tricks. Yeah, and now, Corey, uh, you know, no cards in hand. This uh, Vizier of Many Faces copying a Carnage Tyrant. Uh, his opponent has taken a ton of extra turns. And there's another one. Gotten a ton of opportunities to activate this as Kanta the Sunken Rune. He's going to, Blake is going to continue activating that as Kanta every turn while taking additional turns. Uh, each time he's taking deeper and deeper, finding more time warp effects. And Oh, and are we now on turn one? And remember... There is no requirement on in this situation. Blake could end up taking all five of these turns, so it is not out of the question for him to come away with a win in this uh, game through another copy of Carnage Tyrant, anything like that. The biggest question is that can he afford to cast those threats and do the Nexus of Fate? He's going to be pretty conflicted. This might end up a draw. Yeah, I think uh, at this point it looks like it will likely end up as a draw. I mean, as unless one of these two players decides to concede to the other. It's such an unfortunate situation here for Corey Baumeister, too, because he's got so little ability to actually change the course of events at this point. You know, some usually you think, all right, well, it's five turns. I'm going to get half of them at least. But it's just in a rough spot now. There is still a copy of Nexus of Fate in hand for Blake. We're taking a look at this top four of the library and got to Ferry. Got Search for Azkanta in hand. Trying to put together any semblance of a way to win this game. I think Blake might just be running through his mind, running through his deck list. What did I bring in? What could I have available? What are my odds, you know, if I miss it this turn, next turn, of any way to actually close this game out? A Carnage Tyrant 
could do it with maybe uh, trying to find some way to play it at, on one turn and then take some additional ones. But I think at that point, mana becomes a very difficult consideration. Another copy of Nexus of Fate, always a good way, but neither one of those, the cards <laughs> that Blake is looking for. There is the other copy of Carnage Tyrant. If there is a way to make this come together, it's going to be with that card. I just don't know if that time frame is actually there. Now remember, there is that Baral Chief of Compliance out as well. We're going to gain three life off of this Gift of Paradise, so you're going to start seeing Blake Hurdle casting some instants or sorceries. It's going to look like he is paying too little for it. It is because that Baral Chief of Compliance, instants and sorceries you control, cost one less to cast. Yeah, now Blake Hurdle, uh, one turn shy of being able to swing for victory over the course of two turns with this Carnage Tyrant. On his third turn, he's going to get to cast it. On, his, on the fifth turn of extra turns, he'll get his first attack in. Wait, that's not entirely true. He has a... Well, he has got enough mana because of the cost reduction of Baral. He can actually cast both the Nexus of Fate and the Carnage Tyrant using that Uscon to the Sunken Ruin oh, on the third right. turn of the game. Oh, you're absolutely and right. And he could be looking at taking both turns four and five, and he would have that turn four to try and come up with an answer. Ooh, and now it requires a land. He lost the Baral, and now he would also need to find an answer to the Walking Ballista. It's oh, no, he's, he's got enough mana because he has the, uh, the Gift of Paradise, right? So he's, he's got seven remaining here. You're right. Yeah. There it is. It's going to be Nexus of Fate. And if Blake can find something, if he has like a Teferi in hand or as the draw, then if he used that, he can minus it on the Walking Ballista, and he would find himself taking the win here in the extra turns of the game. Let's find the answer. Commit to memory. Uh, I don't think he, does he have any of that right now? Trying to run through my mind. I'm getting so excited about what the options are. We find a chart, of course. There's going to be additional draws. And Corey probably just going to block here, not remove the counter, just simply block. Yep, it does have trample, which means removing the counter would not have done a whole lot of good. Yeah, so now uh, Blake Hurdle, can he take an extra turn here? If he doesn't take an extra turn, then it's going to be a draw. If he does take an extra turn, he's going to have to find some way to make one extra point of damage, maybe with something like Baral. Yeah, he, I mean, he's got this access to chart, of course. So he could draw a couple of cards. He has attacked for the turn, so he's not even going to have to discard. Yeah, he could chart, yeah. of course, into Baral and Nexus of Fate. Wouldn't that be something? That'd be really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Take turn number five and play a Baral. And we're going to use that Gift of Paradise there. The Baral no longer on the battlefield, so making sure that we get that two mana available. Running through the math in his mind as far as, as his options go. And that chart, of course, it's going to draw two cards. Let's see it. It's a land. It's a chart, of course. That's a redraw. Let's go ahead and activate this search for Ascanta. We might just be looking at one more shot at it. There is the Nexus of Fate. Let's go ahead with that one. I just don't know if there's actually the capacity to take this down. Corey Baumeister might get a draw at a single life point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I don't see a way to poke through one extra damage here in the entire list, so. Uh, I'm surprised we didn't see Blake Hurdle go for anything like that chart of course prior to combat to try and find some sort of resource that might be able to, you know, if he, he's gonna be drawing two cards, if he finds something like a Teferi and a Nexus of Fate, then he would be looking at just a clean win. Even actually a Karn, would a, a Karn last turn, if it had come together the right way, he still does have that Baral with a silver counter on it, actually. But we're going to find a Nexus of Fate. We're already in turn five. You might as well take an extra turn on your way out. Yeah. So taking an extra turn, and then it's a draw. Pass to myself, and that's going to be a draw between these two players. They're going ahead and just talking it out now. Corey Baumeister ends up at a single life total. And that is going to be the end of this one. Corey Baumeister, Blake Hurdle, down to the absolute wire. Not able to put it together, this Turbo Fog deck. The inability to close the game against some of these decks occasionally becoming a problem. But there's more magic in this room. There is more magic to see. TJ Rogers here and Jake Van Lunen. We will see you all back right after this.